Build a history with God. Because if you build a history with God, you've got the stories to remember to encourage yourself in the Lord. If you build a history, Karen and I have so many stories, and it's not because we're ministers at all. We're regular people. We've got so many stories through the years of the strangest, out of nowhere, mir unexplainable miracles that have taken place to provide for us. And we just remember those things. One time it was as big as a $10,000 check. Somebody came and, get, and at the last minute, I was already trying to figure out how I was going to explain myself to a special guest that came in. I mean, it just goes over and over and over and over again. But not, but, and a lot of it not related to anything ministry oriented. Just us, just personal stuff. I heard a story the other day of one of y'all was walking down the street and looked down and there's a $20 bill. And you just said, Lord, I really, I gotta have some money. Look down, there's a $20 bill. Praise the Lord. John Osteen used to say, God can get money to you. If you need money, he'll get money to you by requiring a Dachshund puppy to run down the middle of Main Street at 2 a.m. in the morning and up a 12-foot ladder and drop it down your chimney when there's no fire in the pit. If he's got to do that to make it happen, here's the thing. If you don't have eyes to see it, how many of you know that we will see what we have keyed ourselves to see and find? And if you're keyed, and I've been saying this a lot, if you're keyed to see the dirt, that's what you're going to see. I don't know how this stuff works, but as I've also said before, I don't know how a brown cow eats green grass and gives white milk, but it does. I don't have to know. Merle could tell you how the electric lights in here work, but I can't tell you how they work, but I know how to turn them on. And that's what he wants us to learn is how to turn them on. It's not that, and did you know that the darkness is no match in any way? The darkness has never, ever fought a fight with the light. The light does not have to fight with darkness. It just shows up and darkness flees instantly. No stress, the, the light doesn't sweat a bit. It just does what it does. It bees light. <laughs> That's Ebonics. <laughs> Up in here. <laughs> it just is what it is. So if there's a little bit of darkness in your life, then start turning the light on. <laughs> well, where do I find the light? Well, first of all, Find out what God calls light. You know, we sometimes have developed definitions of what light is for us. We enter the day with a whole set of presuppositions and beliefs. We have a lot of suppositions of what we believe is necessary for our security, for our safety, for our provision, how we're going to get that. But we, are, we, but, but we have these presuppositions we enter the day with, things we've, grown, we've learned it through our families, we've learned it through educational principles, more than you want to believe through the media, just by osmosis. I mean, stuff we've learned through the media that has nothing to do with truth, but yet is actually a firm part of what we believe, it would be, a, it would be scary if you realized how much you've learned from craftily designed commercials and how your belief system has been set 
by those things. But at any rate, we walk out the door and th this is our belief systems. This is a ton of the different belief systems that we've got. And then we put those belief systems on and we see everything that happens in our day through that belief system. And what God is doing is he is working to give us a new set of eyes to see with. Because he can't give me anything that's outside of himself. If I look for joy outside of him, you're not going to find it. Anything that lasts, it might be like cotton candy, tastes real good for the minute, but goes away real fast and leaves you with a sugar high, sugar drop. We believe a lot of things about God. We believe a lot of things about Jesus. We believe a lot of things about the Holy Spirit. And many of those are just flat out lies. And so we place these, this religiously trained junk in our minds of how we think God is reacting to us and how he's going to react to this situation because what we've been trained by religion to believe about God, instead of letting the word show us about God through Jesus Christ, did you know that the prime essence of God, the Father Abba, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is encouragement. He is an encourager at its very, very basic essence. He really wants to encourage me? See, when you're in a bar dark place, believe, okay, well, I'm gonna open, I'm gonna open my eyes to, I'm, I'm waiting for God to invade this circumstance with his encouragement. Somehow he's gonna bring encouragement to me in some way through somebody or something because that's what he is, that's what he does. I'm not going to look for the worst possible thing to happen at the worst possible moment. Do you know that some of y'all have a belief system? And I find it sometimes, although this is one that's pretty well annihilated in my life, but it's called Murphy's Law. The worst thing is going to happen at the worst possible time for me. Especially if something good starts to happen, you start looking over your shoulder, waiting for the bad. That is not what the Word teaches you about what God does for us. Right. He is an encourager. Right. He is not one that brings stuff into your life to sap your life of courage. That's discouragement. That's drawing courage out of your life. He is one that comes to breathe courage into your life. He's got a million and one ways to do that. We need to open up our hearts and minds to say, God, I'm waiting for your encouragement. That's who you are. So therefore, something or things are going to happen today that's going to blow fresh encouragement into my heart. Because that's who you are. That's who you are. John 14, and we talked about this last week a little bit. Jesus said, I will send you another comforter. I will send you another comforter. The comforter, we talked about the fact that one of the definitions, accurate definitions of to comfort, some translations read it the way, to encourage. To breathe courage. I will send you, some use the word helper. He's not your opponent. He's the devil's opponent. When you're letting the devil have your way, have his way in your life, then what is happening is God's opposing him. He comes to encourage and breathe fresh courage to us. And he says, I will send you another comforter. So the Holy Spirit was coming. He was referring to the Holy Spirit. So his job was going to be, Jesus labeled him. He gave him a name. That's a very big deal in the Hebrew culture that there, you're named with a name that is your characteristic. It's different with us today. We just go after pretty phonetic sounds or we're copying the name of a relative or whatever. But in the Hebrew culture, when they name somebody something, they named him based on the characteristic of that person. The destiny they knew about that person. The characteristic, the reputation. Well, he gave, when he said he's coming, he gave a name to the one who was coming. And that was the primary characteristic of what's going to be. He is going to be an encourager. 
He's going to encourage you. I thought the Holy Spirit came to make me feel bad about sin. No. He came to convict or convince you about how sin destroys our lives. Because especially in Jesus, he doesn't see you as a sinner. He sees you as someone that's too awesome to be acting like that in the kingdom. And so he will show you that that's working destruction in your life. But he comes to encourage us that there is a better way. However, did he not say, I will send you another comforter. So therefore, he's saying, I have been the comforter. Jesus and the encourager and the helper. It says Jesus went about doing good, healing, lifting the oppression, the burden of all of those who were pressed and cast down. He came as an encourager. I will send you another comforter. I've been your comforter. Now I'm going to get ready. Why do you think they did not want him to leave? But I'm going to send you another comfort. Don't, you're not going to be left comfortless. You're not going to be left without somebody to encourage you. I'm going to send you another comforter. I'm going to send you another encourager. So that's two down, one to go. Then Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Oh, then the Father's primary essence must be to be an encourager. God has a purpose in mind today for me. I don't know what he's got for you, but no, he's got a purpose for you too. And his purpose is to be who he is in your life, an encourager. To encourage you toward the kingdom of God. To encourage you to life. To encourage you to justice, righteousness, peace. To encourage you to peace. To encourage you to a life of joy. We all face lots of discouragement. Do you remember the story of the Apostle Paul when in the New Testament, some of you will remember this, some of you don't, won't remember reading it, but it's kind of a cool story. God came to Paul in his dreams. And in his dreams, he was headed for Asia. But we use, sometimes when we're teaching about the importance of dreams, we'll teach how God uses dreams to do even direct us. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons that part of what we're doing with the coats, and there's some right there, Greg, some more. Part of what they're doing, we're doing with the coats is in a dream, back about three weeks ago, a lady came up to me, and she was like a street lady, and she said, I am so cold. Do you have a coat? And I woke up. And the first thing I thought of was the Macedonian dream. So I knew that was one thing we were supposed to do. Okay, so... Paul had this dream about going to Macedonia. Cool. Paul responded to it. Bless God. And that's the end of the story. No, that isn't the end of the story. You know what Paul said about Macedonia? Basically speaking, it was one of the biggest trials of his life. He said it often in struggles, often in interferes, now, that encourages me. How does that encourage you? That encourages me because I know that I'm not alone in this thing when I get down or get afraid. See, one of the first things that happens, I want to encourage you with this today. One of the first things that happens to us when things aren't going according to the plan that we believe is the right thing for, for us to be happening for us in our lives, because we have made that determination that we want to follow God. And we have said, yes, if you do come with a Macedonian in a dream, you know, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do it because I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. And we get the idea when we begin to encounter fears, 
or fighting or external things, as it says, in many fightings, there was just a struggle going on around him. What am I doing wrong? I mean, I'm trying to follow God here, but if God was involved in this, then things certainly would be a lot easier. I certainly wouldn't be encountering all of this difficulty. God made me a great promise. He came to me with a great promise and a dream even. I'm responding to that great promise. And what's up with the struggles? What's up with the inner fears? God, I'm so sorry. If I was what you wanted me to be, then I wouldn't have so much fear. And I'm so sorry, God. I'm so sorry that I'm dealing with so much fear. God, I, I'm sorry. I wish I was a better child. What's the matter with me? What am I doing wrong? Paul, who wrote by inspiration two-thirds of the New Testament, who gave us the revelation of grace. Would you say that he had an, a big ministry? Would you say that he was pretty mature in God and God entrusted him with a lot? Would you say that he is one to aspire after? Even Paul dealt with, he said, often I'm perplexed. Meaning, what's going on? I don't get it. I don't, I just did the right thing. And it seemed to put me in a worse place. How do I get out of this mess? How do I respond to this? How do I respond to that? Now, I hear the next question coming. I thought God was a God of encouragement. How would a God of encouragement send you right into a place where you would be potentially filled with fear and strife and all of those things? Paul is also the one who said, I have learned, keyword, hold on to the word learned, I have learned Whatever state to be in, I am content. I found contentment in the trials. He knew that God was taking him to a place and there was new covenant truth all around him. He lived in grace. He knew that abundance and prosperity uh, in a material way even is a part of God's provision for us. But he also knew that there are things that go on in real life. And he doesn't leave us alone to figure it out for ourselves. Even when you think he has, I'm here to tell you this morning, if you are in a place of perplexity, you got a twin brother named Paul. Amen. I am perplexed. I don't understand exactly. Now the truth of the matter is, that as far as you know, you've done everything there is to stand. Was it not Paul that said, having done all to stand, stand therefore? And see the salvation of God. He said, I have learned. I have learned. It's a learning process. It's a learning process. I want to share something with you about faith right here that you might not have thought of. How would you like to hear something you might not have thought of? Well, you might have thought about this, but I'm thinking you may not have. Because you know, I personally have prayed a thousand and one, if not more times. I have prayed, Lord, I choose to follow you no matter what. And what I mean by that is... I know that that's going to mean struggle. So faith equals struggle, if not physical, emotionally. I will follow you no matter how I feel, I will follow. No matter how I feel, I will follow. All right, that is not inaccurate. There are many things that we believe that are not inaccurate, but they are definitely incomplete. Because the very nature of faith itself has a power to remold and reform your emotions. Because I'm responding in faith 
I am learning that more and more my emotions are going to respond in a peaceful, yes, this is right, I don't have a huge struggle over it. God wants to take the struggle definition out of the faith. So many of us have lived for so long believing that walking by faith is walking a life of warfare that we've only walked in half of the story. Because faith connects us more and more richly to righteousness, peace, and joy. Now, sometimes initial decisions, the flesh will clamor against that. But I'm saying that faith will have work, begin working something within you where more quickly and more quickly you say, get away from me. Instead of, here we go again. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Well, if I have to, I, okay, Lord, I want to walk by faith. But you know, Lord, walking by faith, oh God, I know it's the right thing to do, but it means I've got to choose against everything I want. Well, say in the first place, I don't think that's really true. Because there is a wanter in you, in your new man, that really wants everything God wants. The devil wants you, and the flesh wants you, to think the worst about yourself. God wants you to think the best about you in him. Amen. You're good. When he created you, he said, Ooh, it's good. It's not only good, it's very good. Yes. It's very good. He looks at you as very good. You yummy. <laughs> No, you, you're beautiful to him. He expects you, not out of false expectation, but out of truth. He expects you to respond once you begin hearing truth. This is about freedom. This is about life. Do you have to make hard choices? Yes. But if your life and if my life is all about only making the hard choices, then there's some place we're believing incorrectly about what faith is really all about, what its result is, and what its power is. But its power is transforming for our emotions. To how many of you is that, of that is good news that as I walk by faith, I can expect for my emotions to be transformed so that I'm not expecting to always be walking a life of more and more and more and more struggle, but I'm expecting that, wait, God's an encourager. He encourages. He wants me encouraged. And in believing that, I'll start to open my eyes to that possibility that there's something around me that'll encourage me today, rather than expecting to see the discouragement. Yes. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes. Praise God, it comes. Do you know what? Faith is coming to you. Sister, faith is coming to you. Stronger and stronger and stronger because you have set your heart to follow Jesus. Faith comes. How does it come? It says it comes by hearing. And by hearing the word of God. Now, I have taught something that's absolutely true, and it was fresh to me, but it is by itself incomplete. Faith comes, and it comes by hearing the word of God. Word there is not the general logic of God. It is the spoken word of God. So, what I've taught is we need to be a, in a place of expecting that God is going to speak things into our hearts because that's what brings faith. Okay? And that is absolutely true. It comes by the spoken word of God. But the complete Hebrew Bible, trust comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through a word proclaimed about the Messiah. 
So what does this mean? One of the ways we get faith is by God speaking to us personally in our hearts in a fresh word that's just spoken in that inner place. But another way that's really highly neglected in really too much of our Christian culture anymore is found in his word, number one, and reading the stories about what Jesus is all about and studying those. Remember we said last week that seek is a two-sided coin and it has two different words that one means to expect a, the presence. In other words, imagine this piece of chocolate cake. Chocolate, chocolate rich chocolate cake. And you want that chocolate cake to be in your mouth. You want to experience it. You want to taste it. There's a yearning within you that is a seeking out of your heart for that chocolate cake. Susan, that's an inside joke. Chocolate cake. And then you eat the chocolate cake. And you experience the chocolate cake. So now you don't just have a picture of the chocolate cake. You've actually experienced that chocolate cake. So that's the first word. To experience what you've seen is to be true. You seek to experience something. You don't seek something for doctrinal validity, for I believe more right ways than you do. You seek to experience what the Word is talking about. You ex seek to experience the word of, word of God, everything He says about Himself. But then there's another word for seek, and He uses them both, and they both have to go together or they don't work right. Then you come to the point of saying, but I won't have my wife or I won't have somebody else to make me that rich chocolate cake sometime. I have to learn how to make that chocolate cake. And we begin to investigate and practice and investigate how to make that chocolate cake. We go into the details of searching out how do you make that kind of chocolate cake. That's the second word for seek. One has to do with having the experience the other has to do with how do you reproduce that experience again and again and again. Those are two different words for seek. So one of the ways that we find out Jesus and have him come to us as an encourager is he will come through the seeking him out through watching him in the word. But secondly, the other one has to do with community. It comes in us sharing the stories about what Jesus has done in our lives. It says, so trust comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through a word proclaimed about Jesus. Amen. So we are dependent on hearing each other's testimonies. We are dependent upon a desire to have more than pictures. I don't want just a picture. That's what religion has done to us. That's what the religious form of Christianity has done to us. It's given us pictures to look at and said, this is what God's will is for your life. And we've been happy to look at a picture book instead of saying, I don't want to just look at the picture book. I want to be the picture. Yeah. I've got to be the picture. I've got to be the picture. Holy Spirit, super glue that on a consciences and people's minds this week. I've got to be the picture. I've got to be the picture. I don't want to just look at the picture anymore. I want to be the picture. I'm not satisfied with just looking at the picture. I've got to be the picture. Hallelujah. Jesus, you are wonderful. And the more we tell the stories of how wonderful you are in our lives, that just breeds more stories among each other. And that breeds faith. 
And Lord, as we look to you and your Holy Spirit through your word and see how you responded that breeds faith, we look to Jesus. We look to the stories of Jesus to birth faith in our hearts by the Holy Spirit.